Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm going first because I think we have a college, uh, college wide open house um, in uh, about an hour and 15 minutes. And usually that happens in October, so we've got a conflict. So thank you for making the adjustments, Dave, and um, humoring me and letting me go first so I can scoot. Um, so uh, I'm going to give you a Keep it under 10 minutes, uh, update on our frog bit control efforts, and then, which has been going on for a couple of years, several years actually at this point, and then also a relatively, I wouldn't say it's a new effort, but some, some relatively recent potential progress on a, on a second effort. Um, and uh, so with our frog bit project, um, I'm gonna go through a little bit of history. It's, uh, we can't look at this as an eradication effort anymore. I don't think there's any way we're gonna get rid of this plant. Um, this basic plan, I'll show you some maps here in a little bit, but uh, basically it grows back up into areas that we simply are not going to be able to get to. Um, but, uh, it's just not going to be feasible. So, but we can control it. And so we've got a, a so that's been, been working. Um, I'll walk you through that a little bit. I've got to um, certainly, uh, rule our lines has been a you know, real force behind that effort since the beginning, um, securing some DEC funding to, to fund a, Quite a bit of effort over three years and then also help uh, segue into a, a, a scale back effort this past year and hopefully years going forward and um, so Lauren very instrumental and really spearheaded this whole thing. The Ham family have been fantastic for letting us use their property over the north end of the lake. Several vehicles every morning for much of the summer doesn't do their lawn any favors and uh, they've been continuing to be very cooperative and we certainly appreciate that. We had a lot of different young people mostly relatively young people College students, high school students um, helped with the project, and then more recently, the <coughs> the town uh, putting money forward towards the uh, this most recent year's effort. All right, so uh, about the plant, you know, we haven't met, we didn't meet last year, so maybe a refresher if you weren't aware of it. This plant was first uh, observed in the lake uh, back in I think it was 2014, as best I can tell from the records from Bob Johnson. So it's been a while. After that, talked to Bob about you know the feasibility of maybe trying to get a control over it. And he said, yeah, it's a floating plant, truly floating. Under most cir circumstances, under most times you find it, it's, it's floating, so it's easy enough to get. Um, more on that later. So we started talking about you know, ways we might approach this. Um, and so that ended up getting some money together to be able to fund some, what we were hoping to be an eradication effort. But here's some of the problem with the plant. Um, the way that its life cycle goes and where it can grow, um, actually kind of defies what we read in the books. It actually can grow up into wet soils, and we've got a big wetland area at the north end of the lake, um, up above North Lake Road, um, area around the edges in some cases. That makes it impossible to get it all in many of the areas where it occurs. It's just not physically possible. Um, it's basically the transition between true the aquatic where you get with a canoe and where if you step out, you know, you're stepping on a, a clump of vegetation and then you sink and you just can't get it. Um, and it produces these what are called turions, these overwintering buds that function as seeds, um, but produces plenty of them and they move in the water. Anyway, um, part of this life cycle and the uniqueness of what we have at the north end of the lake are making this such that we're just not gonna be able to get rid of it from the north end of the lake, or north of the north end of the lake. This is what it looks like if you see it, like, or take it out, if you see it anywhere you know, around the edges of the lake, but that's where you're likely, you're only gonna find it and most of us don't get that close with a boat. Um, so we really gotta make a pronounced effort to go get it. And so there's a, just a standard Sharpie mark. You can see it looks like a, a, a miniature water lily. It has, it's actually a really attractive looking plant, but spreads very rapidly. This is, not a, this is not an over the top density photo. This is typical how it grows. So there's, there's not much light getting past this. The oxygen being produced here is right at the surface, okay? This is a different, this is really altering what's below and we've measured that. Um, just to see kind of how much that would alter the environment up at the north end of the lake, and it does have an impact. And here's what it can look like at the edge. This is a lot of duckweed and scattered frog bit here. This all back here, that's all frog bit. That's just solid. Um, really, not many two ways, not many ways you can fish through that even. Um, that's what the, here's what we can get it mixed up with. This is just a, a kayak here, uh, water lily, white water lily there. You know, leaves about the size of a like a small dinner plate and uh, leaves of frog bit over here, right? About the size of like a half dollar, if any of those are still floating around, right? Um, so easy to tell apart from one another um, if you know what to look for, and it's basically a size difference. Back in, yeah, 2017, Lauren um, basically spearheaded an effort to get some grant, to put a grant proposal together for one of the DEC programs intended to, to fund projects that had a, 
legitimate shot at actually eradicating invasive species, not for just control. And uh, we thought maybe we could do that. Um, so secured that grant uh, from 2018 through 2020. <coughs> We had uh, as many as six to eight canoes on the water, uh, four hours in the morning, four hours in the evening, and, um, and basically hand harvesting as much of this as we could over time. Um, and uh, did a really good job of getting it cleaned up out of the main, the actual lake, but north of North, north Lake Road, there's a beaver dam there as well that uh, maintains that water level uh, higher than the lake almost all the time. And up in that area, right, we've got tens if not a hundred acres or more of wet soil where this plant can grow and it, it is not possible to get to it. Um, so we scaled it back and then this past summer the town um, put up uh, I think it was two thousand dollars to uh, I think that's what it was to fund um, just a, a small crew so we had two out on the canoe uh, for about half the summer and they were able to get everything they could find in the uh, in the actual lake itself and also inspect the entire perimeter of the lake. Okay, so that worked out the way we were hoping it would. So that's good. We'd love to see that continue because uh, this plant grows so quickly if we, you know, scale back, take the foot off the gas and let it come back, so to speak. There's no way we're going to get it cleaned up in the lake, I don't think, with just two people, you know, basically part-time for part of the summer. So there's my plug for We'll be keeping that going. When we started this, <clears throat> Bob had documented this, you know, this is kind of where it was, where we could find it. Uh, old kids and I paddled everywhere around the perimeter here, and you couldn't find it except for right where you see there. But by the, and this was, this would have been 2016, I guess, 2015 or 16. By the time we started the project in 18, um, it, it, we could find it everywhere from basically the narrow point here, just off the bottom of the screen, scattered everywhere around this. Not lots of it, but definitely there. Um, it's easy to, once you get an eye for it, it's easy to find it if you're close, you know, close enough to it in a, in a kayak or canoe. So definitely aggressive. Um, so we got this, like I said, with, with two this summer, got this cleaned up to the extent they could. I'd be naive to think they got everything because, you know, that would be naive. Um, but, uh, but we're basically, I'll say, giving up um, trying to control it up in the, the north end. There's just so much of it and it's so so much of it is so inaccessible. So I would argue we should keep that effort up. You know, two in a canoe work this year. Will it work every year? Don't know, but optimistic that it that it could. The other thing I want to mention briefly. This is something that like Dave, Dave and I've been communicating about this for a long time, and Lauren. But we're hopefully getting closer to maybe some potential, so some funding to uh, to get what would essentially be a floating laboratory, a, a relatively large uh, electrofishing boat, um, one that would be large enough. You know, I teach at the college undergraduate students. I just don't have enough time in life to take them out two at a time, which would be typical, like you see here, operator there in the back, and then two netters up front. Um, but uh, what, we're, what we need to get if we're going to do this is something that we can actually have four people on there. So that's a, that's a, that's a big jump, substantial jump, I guess, um, in terms of boat capacity. But the way this works is, uh, well, it would work <laughs> for us, is to be able to mimic the protocols used by the DEC and all inland waters for, uh, you know, a lot of the sampling is for, for bass, also sampling other species. Um, there's electrical current here. It stuns the fish, doesn't kill them. I mean, the mortality rate is not 0%, but it is very, very low. You err on the side of, you're going to miss some fish, um, and then uh, and trying not to, you know, try to have mortality very, very low, much less than 1% for sure. And uh, so you've got electrical current. I'll how we can see these booms, but they're like a like a, like a spider's legs sticking down the water out in front. And uh, in this particular boat, it's got wires um, hanging down from the edge of the boat. Sometimes the boat itself will actually serve as the, to close the circuit. Generator there in red, um, and then there's a control box for the, the electrical current, frequency and voltage, et cetera, that you can't see, can't see easily from here. A live well right here where the fish are gonna go, and then long handled nets because you're uh, potentially getting fish that are stunned as deep as maybe six or eight feet and their your shoulders are maybe six feet above the water. Um, so this is what we're what we're working towards and uh, so we've got um, Dave you can jump in here obviously please to explain better maybe some of the funding but what we're working on and really close to having a, a proposal to submit to uh, um, Senator Rachel May's office um, for the bulk of what this would cost. This is expensive stuff. We're looking at a unit that might be probably a hundred thousand or a hundred ten thousand dollars. Um, well, the electronics are a relatively large boat and the cost of aluminum. Um, and the CLA has indicated support for uh, a substantial chunk of this. And we've got our institutional advancement folks at the college 
are working on uh, working towards getting some donors um, interested in helping this as well. We had a major lab renovation project about six or seven years ago, which in the big picture isn't that long ago. And uh, some of those folks were very generous to the college in the past, and we're hoping we can get some of them on board, no pun intended, on board to help uh, support this, uh, this effort. So this is in the works, cautiously optimistic. This will be huge for us on the lake, um, the capacity to use this, and it would be a huge shot in the arm for us at the college, which is you know, an important part of the community as well. Um, and students like Rock over here, who's running the camera, because I have to bolt as soon as I get done talking. Um, Dave, do you want to add anything? So Laura Lines is helping us apply for a grant um, through the state. Um, it's kind of a long process, but we're hoping that you know, we start today, you know, a year from now we'll be able to, to have some success with respect to this. Um, in my presentation, I'm going to go over why this is actually a fairly important um, uh, barometer for us, an important thing for us to have as a lake to be able to actually understand what's happening in the full ecosystem. So I'll go into that in a little bit of detail, but Thad, <coughs> let me just throw this up to you. Thad does sampling every year, but what would you say, and I'm putting on the spot, but what would you say <laughs> the difference between having this boat is in terms of accuracy versus the netting and then the fish kill of the netting versus this? Sure, yeah, that's a good question. Actually, there's another, I forgot, I have another photo of another example there as well. Um, so the, uh, the mortality rate is low in both cases. Uh, the trap nets that we use, they're a passive system, they're like a giant minnow trap that we, and this is what many of you have heard me, well actually students in the last about four or five years um, reported on data. The advantage here, and this is huge, is that this is an active method. So this is actually moving through the water. Um, the trap nets we use are much more, I'll say weather dependent, like because I, I can't, we can't go out and move those day to day. We just don't have time because I've got three hour labs we don't have eight to 10 hour work days like we could have who were you know, undergraduate students within the context of that program. Um, so we can cover, like with five of us, um, we could cover a quarter mile, half a mile more, depends on how many fish we capture, because you've got to process them, that is to collect the data, but pro uh, collect data along much, much more of the shoreline over a period of a couple of hours. And this is all that happens at night it doesn't have to, but that's when the fish are coming in, relatively shallow. So that's typically when electrofishing by boat is done. Lots of lights, uh, the motors are relatively quiet, um, so, and, and the electrical current doesn't shock the whole lake. Um, it's, doesn't, the actual potential hazard to a human or a, a swimming dog doesn't extend more than tens of feet away from the, the boat. So um, that answers that question pretty well. Yeah, so um, it's a really good question. This is what we'd be hoping for. That'll be me over there until I meet my demise or retire, right, or somebody else who gets to use it. And then, you know, happy college students learning lots of really hands-on stuff um, in as real of a fashion as they can. And um, yeah. any other questions? Frog made a question, Ben. Uh, sure. Just, just curious. Uh, I have no idea. As far as the efforts for the frog bit, uh, how much money is has been spent in, on those types of efforts? Is it a significant amount of dollars, and where does that money come from? Who who funds those efforts? Yeah. Um, so the question was, where is the how much money, and where has it come from for the frog bit efforts so far? I forgot to mention that the with the DEC grant that was just shy of fifty thousand. I think it was forty eight thousand dollars, and that was a, a reimbursement program similar to the way that if we can get funding through um, Rachel May's office where it's uh, the purchase, or the, the money is expended and then we get it reimbursed. And the way we worked that was we basically, we laundered it through the college because we could hire part-time part -time folks easily, relatively easily through the college. We did that and then submit a voucher to the town where they get reimbursed from the state and reimburse the college. Did that come out right? Was that a three-year grant? That yeah, that was the three-year grant, so that was the, 48 or 49,000 over those three years. This past year, 21, I think it was an expenditure of 2,000. I'm looking around to see if anybody from the town is nodding their head, but I don't see anybody. I think that's what it was. Um, so it, it funded the, the two that worked on it for, I think it was 75 hours at, at minimum wage. I think that comes out to about $2,000. So it's relative, I'm gonna say it's relatively a small amount compared to what we spend on you know, many other things associated with the lake. Mm -hmm. The plant's not gonna take over the lake because it is, once you get away, it can't, it gets pushed against the shoreline 
if, if it were to become dislodged from where it's, where it's growing. Um, so it's not gonna spread throughout the lake, but along the shoreline where it can spread, and the North Lake is much more sheltered than a lot of other areas, um, it makes those areas basically unusable. I mean, you can still paddle through them, but that's kind of tough. And uh, not many people want to fish when you've got that consistent layer of vegetation. Um, it can be very frustrating. Yeah, good question. The question is, could the could frog bit be spread by boat activity, right? And I would say the answer would be probably not very frequently uh, because it doesn't, the only time you're going to find it out far enough from the shore in a deep, deep enough water where somebody's going to be, you know, running through there um, at any under power with a prop, you know, churning things up. Um, it just doesn't get out that far unless it would happen to come loose. Like that'd be very occasional. Um, more of a, just a natural spread. So um, I would say probably not many people even paddling in shallow water because most of us were out kayaking, canoeing. We kind of avoid going through really dense vegetation because it's more difficult. Um, but it, it could happen that way. If it were to get down to where we're taking boats in and out, which we haven't seen it yet, if, but if it did, then that would be more of a concern because it's certainly, um, these photos, you can imagine much of that mass of stuff that we're seeing there, it's all connected. You grab one piece, right? And for me to you, I start to pull on it and the whole mass may start to move towards you. Um, um, but, uh, but like I said, it's only along the edges and it's not down where we put boats in and out um, at this point. What do you do with it once it's harvested? Oh, what do we do with it once it's harvested? So basically, you know, it, it has to be in an aquatic environment to survive. So we basically wad it up and put it up on shore. And uh, within a couple of days, it's dry and drained enough. It's, it's done. Um, and it actually starts to go from a, you know, a pile maybe this high. And it just starts to, it's mostly water, most of what we're getting. So it, and it starts to decompose pretty quickly because it's all fairly thin, whippy stuff. Um, so we have kind of put it out of the way, trying to make sure we're not putting it where somebody Oh, what's this pile of stuff doing here? You know, near our, our dock. We load the canoes and then you know put it someplace where it's out of the way, to the best we can. Um, so, what, the, the purpose of the electric boat is to monitor the fish population in the lake. Right. But yep. And then when you do catch like invasive species like scarlet carp and stuff, you take them out. If we did catch, yeah, we would. Yep. I would. Well, okay. Let me say this. I would make sure that's okay with the DC because I don't have as part of the permit. I got a hold to use unusual means to capture fish. That's not part of the, the deal, but I would double check and I can't think they would object to that. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it would be a really good mechanism for detecting um, invasive fish species because you cover a lot of water and, um, and it's, a, it's an effective means. You don't capture all the fish. I mean, you, you don't want to capture, you want to keep as many, minimize mortality, and that means you're going to lose some of them. And some are, some are relatively susceptible say, you know, for things in the pike family, like we have lots of chain pickerel, they tend to just scoot away from the electric current, so you, you get fewer of them proportionally than things like, you know, bass. And, uh, but also, this is the same method that was used by the DEC to see if our, that walleye stocking program um, was successful, because you're, because you're capturing all, you have the potential to capture all kinds of fish that are there, even though you might be targeting and specifically interested in, you know, for example, smallmouth and, and largemouth, for example. Right, any other questions? The one thing I would add is that, um, just with respect to the funding, um, Rachel's been out in Rachel's office with her staff. They actually reached out to the CLA to see if we had programs that um, needed some funding um, because they do have some additional money, which is her and her staff are very interested in the lake. So um, I give them a lot of credit because that's a, it's a pretty unique thing to have that. Um, from somebody, so I'm very happy to hear that. Thanks. All right. Thanks, everybody. See you next year.